Well, turn your Bibles, please, to uh, Matthew chapter 17. That's where we're going to be having our class tonight. I uh, want to say that it sure is good to be here in my office doing this video because that means that me and Tracy are out of quarantine. Uh, we've, we tested uh, on Monday, tested negative, so we, we never had it, and uh, we're very thankful for that. But uh, please remember Bruce Reeves in your prayer. Uh, he, he does have uh, COVID. Uh, uh, he, he had uh, a case of uh, pneumonia, and uh, he's really uh, struggled with this virus, and, and let's, uh, let's pray for his recovery. And uh, we have confidence that he will uh, recover soon. Uh, also remember uh, Stephanie Henderson in your prayers. Uh, she is still at St. Vincent's Hospital in Little Rock, and uh, she's doing better than she was, um, and uh, we're very hopeful for her as well. Uh, in Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 through 27, we have a passage of Scripture that shows the importance of faith. Uh, faith just affects everything. It, uh, it affects how often we pray, uh, how often we read the Bible, how often we study the Bible. Uh, it uh, determines how successful we are in, in living our lives for Jesus Christ. And at times we, we get into a rut and we're just not as dedicated to Christ as, as we ought to be. And uh, it may be that that's because our faith is suffering. Uh, here are some lessons that can be learned from this very interesting text in Matthew chapter 17. And the first lesson that I want us to think about is that when we rely on ourselves instead of on God, we fail. Uh, because that was the problem with the apostles here as we read in Matthew 17 verses 14 through 21. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling to him and, and saying, Now here is Jesus and the three apostles, Peter, James, and John, who have come down from the Mount of Transfiguration, which we studied last week. And uh, they found a, a multitude gathered around the other nine apostles. And one came out of the crowd, and he's begging the Lord for mercy. And he said in verse 15, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So his son was having uh, epileptic seizures, which caused him to be in constant danger of uh, burning and, and drowning. He did not have control over his body. So verse 16 the man said, I brought him, I brought my son to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. Now, those words are very harsh. When he, he calls these uh, people he's addressing a faithless and perverse generation, and you would think maybe that he's speaking those harsh words to the multitudes, but he's not. He's speaking them rather to his apostles, those who were closest to him. And he's saying, uh, how long shall I bear with you in your unbelief? And so in verse 18, Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Now, what he said, what's said there in verse 21, when Jesus said that this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting, that says something about the apostles. And I had a question in your study questions that relates to that. Uh, what does 
Matthew 17, verse 21 indicate about the disciples' ineffective approach to casting out the demon? Well, they had acted in a very self-sufficient way. They were relying too much on themselves and on their own power instead of trusting in the power of God. How many times have we tried to work out a problem on our own? Maybe a, a, a problem in our home, maybe a marriage problem, or a problem at work, a problem at school. But did we ever think to pray to God? Did, did we think to consult God? Did, did it ever occur to us that we needed to go to the Bible and consult what, what God has to say about this matter? Uh, how many times have we have we tried to work out a problem on our own? James said that when we're going through tough times, we, we need to look to God in prayer. In James 1 verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. In the context, he's talking about going through trials. James 1 verse 2, count it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into various trials so he's saying then in time of trials and hardships in this life, go to God for wisdom. And, and, and we also need to remember to, to listen to God in time of difficulties in our lives. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 1 is, is kind of an uh, amusing verse, but it's one that we need to take very seriously. And uh, it's very straight and to the point. Uh, Proverbs 12, verse 1, indicates that we, we need to listen to God. Not only do we need to be talking to God in, in prayer and asking Him for wisdom and insight and strength in time of trials, but also we need to, to, to uh, listen to Him. In Proverbs 12, verse 1, Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. And he just said he's, he's stupid. And if we're not going to God and to his word and, and listening to him and the instruction that he offers us in the Bible and, and the, the wisdom and the correction uh, that we need that comes from him, then he's just saying we're, we're stupid. And, and we're stupid when we, we, we think that we can rely on ourselves instead of God. And when we do that, then we're just going to fail. All right, so that's lesson number one. Lesson number two, uh, faith accomplishes great things. Uh, that's in verses 19 and 20. Matthew 17, 19 and 20. The disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why, why could we not cast it out? Why couldn't we cast out the, the demon from that boy? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Now, he's not saying that someone might literally do that, pray to God that, that a mountain might be moved from one place to another, uh, but this is a figure of speech. It is a, a metaphor. Uh, sometimes it, 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 uh, it seems like huge obstacles and difficulties in our lives just can't be dealt with. They're too large. Uh, difficulties in our, our marriages that we, we, we think that... Uh, we cannot overcome, or difficulties at work or at school. What Jesus is saying here is that, that faith can move mountain-sized obstacles and difficulties. And he said to the disciples, nothing will be impossible for you. But somebody might say, but, but they couldn't cast out that demon. How, how could Jesus say nothing will be impossible for you when here's something they couldn't do? They couldn't cast out the demon. Well, in, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, here Jesus is sending the apostles out to preach. And it says in Matthew 10, 1, And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power 
over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. So here it says when he sent them out to preach, he gave them power to cast out demons. So the power, it was available to them, but they had to access that power. God gives us power over pride. He gives us power over sexual sins, the power over the temptation to gossip, the power over uncontrolled anger in our lives. But we have to make the choice to access that power or else we will not be successful. Paul said in Philippians 4.13, I can, and that's the attitude we need, I, I can. But he said in that verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And we must make sure then that we're not relying on our own strength, but the, the strength that we get from Christ. And we need a positive attitude that we can move mountains, uh, figuratively speaking. Mountain-sized obstacles and difficulties in our lives can be moved uh, if we will access the power that is available to us in God and his son. So when we rely on ourselves instead of on God, we fail. When we rely on God, great things are accomplished. Uh, we, we all need to commit then right now uh, to, to growing our faith. Uh, the apostles, they, they saw the need to grow their faith. They came to Jesus in Luke 16 and verse 5 and said, Lord, increase our faith. Now, if the apostles would make such a request, then we shouldn't be so prideful that we can't do it. Uh, we, we, we grow our faith through personal study of the Bible, through prayer, through constant effort, through focusing on the right things, spiritual and heavenly things. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2, Paul said, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. But we, we just cannot grow our faith when our mind is, is not where it ought to be. All right, and, and then a, a third lesson that we can learn from this passage is that we should want preachers to be repetitive. We should desire repetition from the pulpit. We should desire repetition from the, the classroom. Uh, question number three that I gave you was, how was Jesus' prediction in Matthew 17, 22 and 23 different from his prediction in Matthew 16, 21 and 22? Well, it wasn't very different, but it, there was a slight difference. In Matthew 17, 22 and 23, it says, Now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, said to the apostles, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. Well, in, in chapter 17, he added another detail. And that is that he would be betrayed. Now, in, in Matthew 17, 23, though, he repeated what he already said in Matthew 16, 21 and 22 to the disciples. And that is that he would be killed and the third day rise again. The apostles needed the repetition. And that's why Jesus repeated himself, because they needed that repetition. They needed the repetition because... They were not seeing God's eternal plan and how it involved the way of the cross. Jesus must go to Jerusalem, suffer, and be killed. Now, uh, Peter later knew that repetition was necessary, and, and that's why he said what he did in his second epistle, there in 2 Peter chapter 1 and uh, in, in verse 12. He said, For this reason... I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know them, though you know and are established in the present truth. 
He said, there are some things you already know, some of the truths that have already been taught to you, uh, but I will not be negligent to remind you of these things that you have already learned and, and, and come to know. And Peter thought that, that failing to remind brethren of what they already knew would have been negligence on his part. He said, I'll not be negligent to do this. We, we shouldn't want a, a preacher to preach an hour and a half long sermon when it should have been a 30-minute sermon. The only reason it took him an hour and a half is because he just kept repeating himself over and over and over again. Uh, it should have been a 30-minute sermon is what it should have been. And so I'm not encouraging that kind of repetition. But, but we should want preachers to, to preach the same Bible truths over and over and over again for the next generation. Our young people need them. But also, we need them. We need them for our own faith. And so there's a difference between a preacher repeating himself, maybe, maybe repeating a, a sermon that he preached just a year before, uh, and, and doing it because he's lazy, and, and then a preacher repeating himself because he knows that the people need it. We're thinking of the people. We're thinking of, of the repetition that is necessary for our learning. And uh, then a, a fourth lesson is that Jesus satisfies our need for assurance that he is in control. And, you know, the apostles needed that assurance because he has told them now twice that he will be killed. And that just didn't match up very well with their belief that he was the Christ the son of the living God, as Peter had just confessed him to be back in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16. Now, how is the omniscience, the all-knowingness, and the omnipotence, all-powerful, how is the omniscience and omnipotence of Jesus demonstrated in Matthew 17, 24 through 27? Let's go back to our text now. Matthew 17, 24 through 27 when they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the temple tax? Now, every male Jew, uh, 20 years old and, and older, was, he, he was uh, uh, taxed annually to maintain the temple. There was a temple tax. And so they're asking Peter, why does your master, why does Jesus not pay the temple tax? Now, Jesus wasn't there hearing that. And he was not there to hear what Peter had to say in answer to the question. And here's how Peter answered it in verse 25. He said, yes. And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipating him saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? And Peter said to him, From strangers. Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. Uh, the reasoning is that since Jesus is God's son, then he should not be required to pay his father's tax. Verse 27, nevertheless, Jesus said, nevertheless, lest we offend them. Now, now, before I read the rest of that verse, even though Jesus did not owe this, this tax, he knew that paying it would not be in, be in any violation of, of a command of, of God. Uh, but if he refused to pay it, then that might then some might view it as an act of rebellion so as not to, to cause anyone to stumble then through misunderstanding. He made the concession to pay the tax. He was not obligated to pay it, but lest he cause someone to stumble through misunderstanding, he said, I'm going to go ahead and pay the tax. I will not be violating the command of God by doing it, 
And so I'll just do it for the sake of, of others. All right, so here's what he said in verse 27. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and you. And I have a footnote in my Bible here on the, the word peace. You'll find a piece of money, that is, in the mouth of that fish that you catch. And the footnote there says, and it gives the, the Greek word translated peace, it says the exact temple tax for two. So the amount of money that was in the mouth of that fish, it'd be just the right amount for two people to pay the temple tax that was required. Now, uh, I ask you, how is the omniscience and omnipotence of Jesus demonstrated in those verses? And uh, here are five things that I've listed. First of all, in knowing Peter's thoughts, because we said Jesus wasn't there when that conversation took place between Peter and, and, uh, and, and the ones asking him about why, if his teacher paid the, the temple tax. Jesus wasn't there to hear uh, Peter's answer. So he knew his thoughts. Secondly, in knowing that Peter would catch a fish. Thirdly, in knowing the fish would have a coin in its mouth. Number four, his omniscience and omnipotence is seen in, in bringing about what we might call the, the logistics of, of the event, uh, getting Peter and the fish together uh, so that Peter would catch that fish. And then number five, in knowing that the coin would exactly cover the tax that was owed by Peter and himself. Uh, that's an amazing miracle. Uh, it's not something that was, that was just uh, happenstance. It couldn't have happened coincidentally. It happened because there was omniscience and because there was omnipotence presence not only in the, the person of God, but in the person of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Everyone, as we, we close this, this video now, every, everyone should examine the evidence which supports their faith and examine it with, with honest hearts. There, there is the evidence of God's perfect creation there's the evidence of God's perfect word. And there's the evidence of the miracles which are recorded for us in the Bible, like the one that we just read. We do not want anyone to become a Christian just, just because we, we want them to, but because they want to. And it must be their decision based on their faith. Please remember that if you want to be baptized for the remission of your sins, as is taught in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, then we can make arrangements for that to happen any time, day or night. We look forward to seeing you soon.